Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 123 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Now, just quickly, before we jump into the main part of the show, I wanted to let you know about my online PR course and group coaching program, Vegans in the Limelight. Now, this is a 12-month online program where you have video training that teaches you everything you need to know about how to do your own PR. You can ask questions on the platform and you can also post your proposed pitches and media releases before sending them to journalists to get my feedback. You also get to jump on a monthly live group call where you can ask whatever questions you want about your business and you can get tailored help from me on anything to do with raising the profile of your brand. So it might be that I look at your website and give you some feedback or how to improve your LinkedIn profile and other marketing and PR topics. So if you'd like to find out more about that, just hop on over to veganbusinessmedia.com and you'll see a link there for Vegans in the Limelight. And now on to the main part of the show. In this episode, I interview Annie Rue, founder of the Jackfruit Company in Boulder, Colorado in the US. Annie started the company in 2011 while traveling to India as a pre-med student and trying her first jackfruit. She discovered that this large fruit had many nutritional and ecological benefits, but also that the majority of jackfruit grown in India was going to waste. Passionate about global health, Annie saw this as an opportunity to improve lives. So while she was still attending Harvard, she began building distribution systems, improving market opportunities for farmers, and creating a working international supply chain to make jackfruit more available around the world. The Jackfruit Company currently works with over a 1,000 farming families to supply jackfruit to over 6,000 retailers in the US. The company makes a range of vegan products from jackfruit, which has been compared to pulled pork and other shredded meats, that are positioned as healthy, ethical and sustainable. In this interview, which was recorded live at the recent 2019 Plant-Based World Conference and Expo in New York, Annie discusses the challenges involved in creating a company based on a product that few people know anything about, why marketing a product solely as being ethical isn't always enough for consumers, and the changes she had to implement to make jackfruit more appealing, the importance of hiring local expertise to scale up the supply chain, the different stages and methods she's used to raise capital and hire key strategic staff, why she avoids using meat-based names for the company's products, and much more. Here's the interview with Annie Rue from The Jackfruit Company. Hi, Annie. So I enjoyed your talk earlier today. As we mentioned, we're at the Plant-Based World Conference and Expo, and I'm looking forward to digging in a little deeper into your company because you're quite an interesting entrepreneur. You're one of the youngest entrepreneurs I've had on the show. Um, The first question I always ask everybody is why? So why do you do what you do? And I'm particularly interested in your journey of leaving med school um, to launch the Jackfruit Company. So tell us about your why. I why. Um, I was really passionate about global health and global health delivery. Really, how do we get the best solutions we have to people who don't have access to them today across you know, healthcare and medicine? And what I found was that healthcare and medicine were coming in too late and the problems I was seeing were rooted in poverty. So when I first saw jackfruit in India, I was in India working on a healthcare venture, really in global health delivery. 
Um, I was amazed by the opportunity to convert this this natural resource, really a miracle crop, to incremental income at massive scale for thousands and hopefully someday millions of farming families. Um, so that was the original motivation to focus on jackfruit. Um, but what I learned over time was that jackfruit also had so much to add for consumers. Um, really, it is the meatiest plant on the planet, so it has the opportunity to deliver you know whole food, plant based. Um, in a, in a space that you're often looking at quite highly processed foods. Jackfruit is something, because it's, it's naturally meaty, um, we can deliver foods that are you know, both meaty and minimally processed um, that meet consumers' needs for you know, many, many different types of meat alternative formats. And one of the things that's, that's also so exciting about young jackfruit is that with it, we're able to address two of the top <laughs> 10 contributors to global warming, um, both you know, deforestation and... Um, the fact that you know, meat industry is one of those top 10 contributors. So we're replacing consumption of meat with something that's one of the most sustainable plants out there. I love it. I love it. So what was some of the, when you were first starting out, and I know you touched on this in your talk, which was interesting, you talked about you had one, you discovered one type of jackfruit and that didn't work out and you switched to another. So can you talk a little bit about some of the key challenges when you first started the company and how did you handle them? Yes. Um, well, so that was sort of the marketing angle of the company. I was really... Um, you know, excited about jackfruit and introducing this miracle crop to the world. Um, so first of all, was trying to understand what are the biggest challenges that have prevented it from becoming mainstream so far. And those were really, you know, supply chain and product development and, and marketing. So I was um, focused first on, on supply chain and it's certainly been a tremendous investment by our company over time. I've been there 30, been to India 32 times over wow. the course of building the supply chain. How long? Um, since 2011. Wow, that's a lot. That's it's a lot a of trips. <laughs> yeah, um, to build the supply chain and develop the products, and then um, you know the product development. There were certain challenges with that. You know, the the fruit is um, extremely genetically diverse, and then it's also um, a fruit that. Uh, rots fairly quickly once it's been harvested. So we really needed to develop a just-in-time supply chain to ensure the highest quality of, of the foods. And then the, the other aspect was the marketing of it. So um, you know, we were trying to introduce a food that people have never heard of. And when we were focused first on ripe jackfruit, um, you know, I thought that the fact that it was really helping farmers was going to be enough to sell a product and realized that it wasn't. We, we really needed to be able to deliver much more to the consumer. And I was so excited to assemble across young jackfruit when a farming family prepared a jackfruit burger for me because um, it had so much to add um, to consumers in terms of what they were looking for really to meet an unmet need, which was, you know, plant-based food that was also just so clean and, and minimally processed. Um, so was then focused on, you know, how do we like leverage all the work that done on the supply chain side <laughs> with young, with ripe jackfruit um, to deliver, you know, jackfruit products, nice. young jackfruit products to the meat alternative category. Got it, got it. It's interesting what you say about the the consumer aspect because obviously as, you know, vegan and plant-based brands, we think, you know, okay, yes, you know, we're ethical, that should be enough for people to buy it. But I think we're finding that and I think some of the, the Beyond Meat and those companies are saying, no, it's got to be the taste first because at the end of the day, even though consumers, they want to be ethical, they still want that taste. So I think it's it's interesting that you, you brought that up. So you mentioned that you've been to India 32 times. Tell us a bit in a bit more detail about how you set up those supply chains because I love the fact that you, you're working with those farmers in India, so you're helping them, they're being paid a fair wage, which is uh, amazing. But that must have taken a lot of setting up. Can you talk a little bit more in about detail about how you set that up and just working with distributors and retailers, so some of the challenges involved and, and what's what's involved in that? So for you know, for someone who might want to do this not necessarily with jackfruit, but just being involved with, you know, that whole supply chain of farmers, distributors and retailers, what are the considerations and that you need to look out for and that you've learned through doing it? Yeah, um, there's been a lot. <laughs> there's a lot in, in all that. I think um, working with farmers, ultimately, you know, I, I was initially setting up the supply chain, so that's 32 trips back and forth, but um, hiring, you know, local expertise um, at a certain mm -hmm. point um, to continue scaling the work that I'd done there. So we have a team of people on the ground there, you know, 100% of their time on the ground there. And then we have somebody who commutes back and forth, who manages the team there and make sure that we have proper integration with everything that we're doing here. Um, 
you know, forging partnerships with manufacturers was also, you know, a large part of the time um, going back and forth and making sure that we had somebody who was, um, you know, able to deliver on the quality standards that we need, which is the absolute highest quality standards in the world. You know, we're in the United States, we're in the United States market. It doesn't matter that, like, you know, whether they're unfamiliar with jackfruit and don't understand, you know, exactly what consumers are looking for in the final product. We have to communicate all of that back to them um, and and make sure again that they're they're upholding, you know, the the highest standards of quality um, to to make that product. So a ton of um, you know investment that went into ensuring all of that. And then I would say on the marketing, sort of the go-to-market U.S. side, um, for building that part of the supply chain, I think what was most important was being able to communicate to customers and then to you know distributors and any kind of partners. We were using contractors, et cetera, for sales. Like, what is the innovation that we're delivering? We're not just you know new brand and new food that they've never heard of, but we're really something that's servicing an unmet need that um, is a very large market size. Got it, got it. You mentioned, you touched on that. I wanted to talk to you about the team. So you mentioned that you brought people in on the ground um, locally. So at what point did you realize that you needed to bring on staff or to create a team? And how did you know that it would be, that you were ready to do that? So Because obviously hiring staff, that's a key expense and it can mm-hmm. make or break a business. So I'm, I'm curious to know how did you know when and who to bring on at what stage in order to keep the business sustainable? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say I'll reference two different stages. There's sort of like a um, minimum viable product was is something that I think like people use a lot in talking about startups is like that that MVP when you have that and that's like your initial proof of concept. So I developed our initial supply chains, developed our initial products, gotten you know customer feedback, and then got cut like a customer who is committed to buying like at a certain you know future date if we could make all of this scale. To at least like a commercial level, and at that point, like when were those? Where did those customers come from? Were they specifically just online before you got into retailers? No, it was a retailer actually. Yeah, partnering with the buyer on like getting their feedback on initial concepts of the product, Um, and then I raised capital once I'd gotten that commitment um, to basically produce everything at commercial scale. and then after I got our first um, retail account, like a national commitment from our first retail account, that was when I hired our head of sales. Oh, and that was really okay. my first like critical hire. Um, so those were some of the moments I would say also one of the areas that we've been monitoring throughout time was when are we really going to see Jack for embraced by food service enough that we feel comfortable to you know, bring on full-time you know, headcount for, for food service because, of course, like it needs to evolve as you mentioned, like quickly enough that like you're as a company able to sustain that part of the enterprise. And so like for us, our, our food service business doubled last year, like organically because at the, you know, we didn't have a head of, we didn't have a full-time head of food service last year. We didn't have full-time food service headcount. And and so that doubling of that part of our business was the news to us. Like now is the time to hire and to invest against growing this segment. Right. I love that. It's really good advice that you, yeah talk to those stages you mentioned you raised capital so one of the questions i was going to ask is how has the business been funded to date so can as much as you're comfortable sharing yeah so our first capital uh, i did a kickstarter campaign oh. uh when i was in college and then i the next was you know winning business plan competitions in how college how much was a kickstarter for that was for five thousand okay yeah, yeah and then i think across the business plan competition something like twenty five thousand. um and that was like enough capital to initially like you know minimum viable um, product concept in that in, in order to then raise money from angel investors to do mm-hmm. our first commercial production run and um, that like I had just spent I'd spent a lot of time when trying to raise a Kickstarter just trying to build a network and talking to everybody who would listen about jackfruit and what yeah. I was doing and so like by the time I was reaching angel investment I, I had like you know a, a short list of people who I knew did angel investing in our space and literally the first five people I approached on that list invested and we were done nice. with that round. So nice. um, beyond that, um, it's been about half of our total investment raised to date has been from angel investors and then about half of it has been from institutions, investment firms. Fantastic, fantastic. On the cost of the product, because I know and I, when I've talked to other vegan entrepreneurs, particularly in the food space, but other spaces as well, is the 
with certain products like plant-based products particularly if they're clean and they're healthy the end product can end up being quite expensive you know like you know similar to say an organic product for example how do you go about educating consumers that a friend of mine um, Justin who has a, a vegan shoe store in Melbourne says to me um, someone somewhere is paying for your bargain you know right. and you're gonna, so I'm curious how do you kind of handle that right. aspect of it right I would say um, you know it's it's a, it's an added challenge for us to try to educate as much on that on that line um, because we've already got so much to educate people about. It's like what is jackfruit? Where does it come <laughs> from? Um, how does it grow? What sh how should I cook with it? Um, like you know, what are the nutritional attributes of it? What does it taste like? So it's we've as much as possible actually tried to go head to head with with any kind of comps in terms of price on shelves, so people didn't feel like they'd have to pay a premium for jackfruit. We really wanted them to not have a barrier to trial and also not have a barrier to repeat. Just make this part of your mainstream consumption. So if you were going to buy that other thing for, you know, what would be that other thing though? Um, so in that original like our product category, category that we've been in for the longest time, it's refrigerated to meat alternatives so there's like tofu tempeh oh, okay. seitan right. sauce seasons like tempeh seitans tofus so um to be basically price parity on a dollar per ounce basis okay okay it's interesting and i noticed as well in your talk you mentioned that you call it jackfruit your company is called the jackfruit uh, company and your products uses the term jackfruit rather than you know pulled pork or you know the kind of those terms um just explain a bit um why you've chosen to do that rather than because one argument obviously is you know we need to get people to understand what it is they're eating so if we call it you know vegan pork or vegan ham they'll understand what it is they're eating so tell us a bit about your reasoning for doing the opposite yeah um well, we've, you know, we've really embraced transparency across our entire company. So there's that directness of our relationships with our farmers. There's the fact that, you know, jackfruit's claim to fame is that it's meaty. It's the meatiest plant out there. It's right? a great tagline, so, actually. I like that. The yeah. meatiest plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so um, we, we really need to be um, transparent across everything that we're doing. And that's that applies to even just how we're naming our products is like this is you know, smoked pulled jackfruit. Like that's that's what we did to the jackfruit. And like it also like um, is authentic to, it's, it is a clear tie to the, the meat that it's referencing, yeah. but it's also just being direct about what it is. Got it, got it, fantastic. Now, one of the things I ask people, and there's no right or wrong answer, and it, you know, people have di different opinions on it, is the use of the word vegan versus plant-based in your branding and marketing. Tell us about how you, the terminology that you use and why. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really looking to educate about whole food plant-based. It's, um, it's something that, Again, jackfruit has a very clear ability to own. Um, and so looking to focus on that and not not as much about vegan specifically, um, although we do have a lot of consumers who are vegetarians or vegans because jackfruit can you know add value to their cuisine and the way that they've chosen to eat every day. It's just that you know we're also looking to make jackfruit part of people's diets, whether they're um, you know, meat eaters most of the time, um, flexitarians, reducitarians, like we want jackfruit to play its role in transitioning everybody closer and closer towards, you know, a way of eating that's great for them and great for the planet. Yeah, got it, got it. And um, in terms of marketing strategies then, because as you, you've said you had a lot of education to do, um, what, what um, marketing strategies have you used to date and which have been most effective? Yeah, I mean, the single most effective thing has been getting great product out and great packaging and getting that on shelves in front of in front of consumers where we had a point of difference to add value for them. Um, there's nothing in in marketing that we could do that would have that same impact, right? Like you can create awareness about a product, but if the product isn't delivering something that they want, there's certainly enough competition and certainly enough companies out there with much bigger marketing budgets than us that we wouldn't have a point, we wouldn't have you know, enough to continue growing um, if we weren't having the right product. So I would say like that's really the thing to for you know, any entrepreneur to focus on first is that your product is really de delivering value for consumers that you find a way to communicate that on your package. Mm -hmm.
but how and what what actual strategies have you used because you can have the, the best product in the world but unless people know about it they're not going to buy it so yeah. how have you been promoting it and what, what have been the most effective strategies has it been social media has it been in-person taste testings how is it what, what have we just said been the most effective strategies for letting people know about the jackfruit company yeah and i think again it comes back to you know partly where we are in our stage of growth is that we really haven't had that much money to spend in marketing so we see demos as like very effective but we're just at a point now where we're able to spend money in demos and previously it really was about getting the product on shelves and really the awareness aspect is the fact that you're on shelves right like that's your display case for your brand, that's a display case for your product, that is the access to your product. And so getting distribution um, of the product was really the, the marketing that drove awareness of a food that you know, four years ago, nobody knew anything about. And when it's on shelves, is it next to um, products like tofu and the yes. tempeh that you mentioned? Okay, so it's in that. that so it's case. also like just by that framework being marketed as a meat alternative. Yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. So what are some of the lessons, and I know this is obviously, you know, I say you're a young entrepreneur, you're fairly new into your journey of entrepreneurship, although just talking to you, it sounds like you've done a lot in a short space of time. Um, what have been some of the key lessons that you've learned, either personal, professional, or both? Mm, key lessons, so many. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I, I mentioned in the talk on the panel um, that I think is really appropriate and helpful for a young entrepreneur to know is that like you, you don't need to know everything at the beginning to make progress and to build something of meaning. You need to understand like you should chart out your business plan, but between the course of where you are on day one and where you may be three, five years from that point, like many things will change. Mm -hmm. um, it's about like having that right balance of strategy and execution. And like, yes, you need to know where you're going, but then like you need to get from stage zero to stage one and you need to execute to do that. You don't need to know everything and have everything figured out at the very beginning. You need to make progress and build something Something and that like having built something will help you get that knowledge later, right? Like building something proves that you are an entrepreneur who has merit, that your idea has merit, and it will be easier for you to access resources later as opposed to trying to figure it all out at the beginning. Yeah, I love that. I thought that was really great the way you described about the stages. I think that was really good advice. Have you used, I think, did you mention the panel, have you used incubators like to help you? I'm curious to what extra support you've had other than the capital, just yep. what other resources have you had to kind of help you grow as a business? Yeah. Um, so I was selected as a resolution fellow um, when I was still in college. It's a program that's selecting young entrepreneurs, um, young social entrepreneurs and like helping them access like mentorship and advisors. So that's been a very helpful network for me over time. Have okay. amazing mentorship through that. Um, the Global Good Fund similarly is about selecting social entrepreneurs um, and pairing them with mentors and advisors. So also a very helpful network. Um, and then, you know, more so on the food side, uh, relocating to Boulder was like as compared from to where? from Boston, from Boston. Yeah. Okay. As compared to Boston, at least at that time. And the food scene has evolved much more in Boston since I was last there. Um, what was like moving into an incubator for food companies? Because there are so many food companies, natural food companies, startup growth stage food companies in Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, it was access to many advisors. That's you know, Colorado, agencies. right? Yes. Yeah, so we're international. I'm just checking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Boulder, Colorado. Right. Um, that um, was like living in an incubator. Nice, nice. So at the moment, just wrapping up, the fine, uh, the products at the moment, they're distributed across the US, is that right? They're they are. Distributed nationally. Yes. So what's next for you and for the Jackfruit Company? Yes, um, so today we are the second plant-based brand to ever have gotten placed in the fresh meat section of the store. So wow. there's Beyond Meat and now there's us. And so we're oh, really focused wow. on making That's sure that um, we're resonating with consumers there. It's our first, you know, real placement avenue to access flexitarians, you know, meat eaters who are looking to... So you've to, moved from being next to the tofu. We're in, still there, but still we have there. a different product oh, that different is now product, in it. the fresh meat section. I see. And so it's our opportunity to talk to that consumer, a much broader consumer base. We want to make sure that we're resonating and um, turning very highly in that section um, and then continuing to deliver innovation there because we really see that as the future for plant-based meats is, is that merchandising next to meat in a way that makes it very clear how 
you know, to consumers, how they can use it, how often they should use it, um, makes it very accessible. You know, the, the original sort of refrigerated meat alternative section with the tofu and the tempeh, it's can, it can easily be difficult to find in a store. Yeah. It kind of moves from one part of the store to another. There are many people who are interested in eating plant-based who don't even know that category exists. That's right. Including yeah. myself before I started yeah. this company. <laughs> so getting plant-based products and you know, really high quality plant-based products placed next to fresh meat, I believe is the future of this category. In the way that we're going to make it, you know, the whole category grow 10 times, 100 times the size of what it is today. So mm-hmm. we're focused on how do we deliver the very best jackfruit products there. Uh, we're also focused on how do we really get jackfruit into food service and how do we leverage the fact that we do have a world leading supply chain for jackfruit to just make it available to you know, millions of consumers across food service. Food service is looking for plant based options and jackfruit is extremely well suited for chains that either are offering, you know, like a smoked pulled pork type yeah. of product and, and want a vegetarian alternative for that. Yeah. You think about like barbecue chains, think about taco chains, burrito nice. chains. Yeah. Um, or if you're thinking about like a chain that really is prioritizing um, transparent, clean ingredients, transparent supply chains, um, you know, whole food, minimally processed food, made in the back of the house food, we're also a really great fit for them. What about globally? Are you thinking globally or not yet? Um, we're thinking globally to some extent. We really believe that there is an opportunity for jackfruit and other, and other geographies as well but i do think that there is you know significant education that needs to happen and so with the megaphone that we have we want to focus on first using that in a relatively smaller space to really have that reverberation and like you know groundswell awareness creation even just with the consumers we're talking to and we'll look more so um, to international markets further out um, we are though part like forging partnerships to basically be the supply um, for you know other you know whether it's in food service and to some extent retail in other countries because we want to continue to bring that volume to our farmers enable us to expand our impact with the farming families so what do you mean you mean by that is that it wouldn't necessarily be you making the jackfruit products but you would utilize your supply chain to help other companies or did I yeah pretty much that we would be the supplier for the jackfruit and that we're not necessarily fo- like focused on um, as much of the branded presence and the okay. full go-to-market aspect right. um, but but leveraging our supply chain and enabling us to continue helping more and more farmers which is great so it's a win-win it's fantastic it well I actually tasted the product before I did the interview with you and it was delicious so thank you so much for <laughs> speaking you. with me today Annie it's been fantastic thank you for having me So that was Annie Roo from The Jackfruit Company. You can find out more at thejackfruitcompany.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 123. Now for some vegan business news highlights. Wild Earth, the vegan biotech pet food startup, has closed its Series A funding with an investment of $11 million led by VegInvest, a venture capital firm supporting early stage companies striving to replace the use of animals in the food system and other industries. This is VegInvest's second investment in Wild Earth. Other current investors include Mark Cuban of Shark Tank fame's Radical Investments. Felicis Ventures, Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, and Mars Pet Care, bringing total funding to $16 million. The investment is being used to accelerate Wild Earth's development of its vegan food for dogs made from an eco-friendly and renewably sourced fungi called koji, a complete protein containing all 10 essential amino acids. The company expects the dry kibble formula to be available in the second half of this year. Again, that's 2019 if you're listening in the future. The company has also moved into its new headquarters in southwest Berkeley at Outermost House, significantly expanding its R&D and business facilities. It's great to see Wild Earth go leaps and bounds in this much-needed area. You can listen to my interview with co-founder and renowned biohacker Ryan Bethancourt in episode 102. Vegan meat brand Beyond Meat has entered into a partnership with Zandberg and World's Finest Meat to make its plant-based products in Europe. The partnership is expected to create additional infrastructure to support growing demand and Beyond Meat's vision of being a global protein company.
On completion of the facility in the Netherlands, which is expected in the first quarter of 2020, the manufacturing partnership will mark Beyond Meat's first production capability outside the US. Localised production is expected to reduce the brand's transportation footprint while increasing the speed in which Beyond Meat can get products to customers across Europe. Last year, Zandberg and World's Finest Meat started distributing Beyond Meat's products throughout Europe across both food service and retail. It's wonderful to see Beyond Meat continue to go from strength to strength, what with its recent IPO far exceeding expectations and now more global expansion. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more free resources as well as details of how we can work together to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. And I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now.